Okay, for this, I, I kind of want us to have time to talk about what, you know, what the other guys have said, see how it's affected, you know, what you thought of your talks, and just, I don't know, just give us a space to sort of bring our ideas forward and actually put them in, in discussion a little bit. Get some deal logos going, or trio logos, or whatever. <laughs> Here. <laughs> so, um... I'm thinking about your talk on Elliot, and um, you mentioned a critique that some people have of Elliot, of him being too academic, too esoteric. You know, he's just playing these little clever games that the clever people can cleverly figure out, and then they can feel clever with him. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a very well stated version of that critique. <laughs> right. Go ahead. But, like, wouldn't that actually, if you were trying to wake people up, like an educated literary class, wouldn't those kind of breadcrumbs be the best thing for them? Yeah, I think in fact that that would be his response to this. So he was that response, or let's put it this way: he didn't he didn't even that that stuff just rolled right off him. He did not care that people thought of him mm -hmm. in that way, mm -hmm. and he, because I think he he wanted to do exactly that. He wanted to say, look, the only way that at least me in my small way is going to um, improve this situation that he saw of this disconnection from our, our tradition was for me to just use it intentionally and put that forward. And, and it turns out he was very popular. He, people liked his poetry and he sold a lot of poems and it was an age when that was still a thing when you could <laughs> When you could still you sell know, poetry, <laughs> you could sell <laughs> yeah. poetry, right? And uh, and he was also he was also a good marketer of himself, I think. And uh, so he he just went went with it anyway. And I think you're absolutely right that that was in in a way part of this project was to just put that stuff in there and then try to make it work absent some real deep dive into it. I think I was trying to say that to some degree with Proof Rock because I think the poem does intrigue people even absent, um, you know, absent knowing all that stuff. Uh, but it, it's like you said, it's breadcrumbs that lead you forward. And then I think like all good artists, their work evolves over time. It becomes uh, a, you know, a lifelong project that, that comes to some other place later. And um, I think it, it, for him, that's, that was also important that it had a, a redemptive um, um, arc in it. Mm -hmm. there, yeah, there's a little, well, again, because it always comes back to this, it, if you think about him modeling himself after Dante as a poet in any way, mm -hmm. Dante's not scared of doing that. Mm -hmm. um, he was the last guy to know everything. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> well, and so, so there's a couple of things there that strike me. One is, so, you know, the notion of universal history, that there's, that you actually can weave things together in a meaningful way, right? And so Eliot had a much harder time of it than Dante did in that just the world was more fragmented by the time that he was writing his poetry. But there's another thing in which poetry, I think poetry like is, that lends itself to poetry because it's capable of communicating or it seeks to communicate almost more than it says, right? So in a game, with good poetry, and this may even be a judge of whether or not it's good poetry, is how many, how many pages of prose does it take to say the same thing or to approximate the same thing? And I'd say good pr prose is going to take, you know, I don't know, five, ten, a hundred times as much as the poetry. And so there's this, I'm not saying that it's a compression algorithm because people hear this sort of like, let's say, richness of communication they have because we live in a computer age, they think, oh, it's a compression algorithm. And it's not. So there's this, because well, ChatGPT's poetry is garbage. Just I've seen it a couple of times, and I'm like, oh, like I can't. There's plenty of other stuff I can't tell that algorithms generate, but what poetry? It's like always. It's immediately obvious an algorithm wrote it. Actually, there's a funny thing about that when when these text generation algorithms started sort of getting good, maybe three or four years ago. It was probably the original GPT program out of it out of OpenAI, they're like, one of the amazing things is it can do, it can write poetry that's, you know, none of our researchers can distinguish from human written poetry. <laughs> and I, I saw some of the examples, I was like, yeah, it's because you guys are all a bunch of AI researchers and you don't know what poetry is. <laughs> and, and you're right, I'm, that, <laughs> it's a little meaner than I meant it to sound, but it's not, so, so poetry is not, 
It, because, okay, look, because when po if poetry is a many-to-many -many correspondence, necessarily you're communicating in a richer way. And one of the ways to do that is to say, they brought my head in on a platter. Oh my goodness, the whole story of St. John the Baptist just walked into the room, right? It, that's an aid of the poetry, I would say. And, it, and, I, and to your point, Jim, that people can still love poetry even when they don't understand all of it. It's true with all this stuff. And a lot of the ancient writers, it seems like they were more than happy to just be like pulling it all in, you know, all the references that let's get Troy in there. Let's get the Bible in there. You know, let's get just as much as we can. Certainly you can. Uh, and the, this was another analogy that I was thinking of bringing in my talk. I brought too much into the talk already. <laughs> but, um, you know, you walk into the Sistine Chapel and it doesn't really take much to be odd by what you're exposed to there yeah and yet at the same time there's a rich universal history being displayed to mm -hmm. you right there and it's got a narrative arc to it and the last judgment is behind the altar and there are figures from greek mythology and um you know so you can start in one place and you can you know with just the awe and the and the you know kind of maybe in, even in a secular world the the humanist love of the virtuosity of what you're seeing. Um, and then it can go somewhere else. It can get deeper and, and uh, bring you further. Um, yeah, it, I, I mean, I just like, I, I, I like that mindset of being willing to approach it in that way. Cause like, this is, again, I, you know, I think about this over and over as poetry. Maybe one way to say poetry is talk about poetry is to say that it's a, a, a way to train you to approach reality appropriately, right? Which is not far off from what Tarkovsky is saying when he says that the aim of art is to make someone ready for to die. And so when you think about approaching someone like Elliot or Hopkins, they're great examples of it. And the first time you come to it, you think, what, what did I just hear? That's like everything in life. You know, you get started at anything in life and you think, what is going on? I don't know. And so, to be a person well actually necessitates the humility to be bad at things. And poetry is a great example of that. Even when you like know how to read poetry, you know, like, I have no idea what's going on. I know a lot, I have a much better idea now of some of the things now that you've explained it to me. But yeah, it's like, if you just give up because you say, oh, this doesn't make sense, it's like, where are you going to get to? And, you know, I start with, I started, I think, more years ago, whatever, trying to see, trying to find resources that would reflect my own um, experience of life, my own internal world, my own emotional engagement with the, you know, kind of realities of being a human. So in that sense, I'm, I'm not looking for a journey at that point of the stage. Let's say I'm not looking for a journey. I'm looking for, a, a, you know, a partner or a or a, um, mm. a reflection of myself of, in mm -hmm, something mm -hmm. else. And here I'm talking about a reflection of some real um, emotional experience, some real important, um, you know, kind of engagement with the way the world is and have to be able to connect with that. But the one thing that, that I hate to keep bringing up Dante, but the one thing that, <laughs> why do you hate that? I don't know, I, just because it seems like an obsession, but no. <laughs> But we can in, quit at any time, really. <laughs> in that and other um, experiences, or Job, Job, my experience with Jess on Job was this way, is that you get that, you, you come to it because it gives you that. You know, Job, mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. in a very dark way, in a certain sense, you, you see some real kind of pain, a reflection of your own pain being expressed there. And that really moves you. It brings you to it and says, yes, that is something I know I have experienced. And yet when you leave it, you're in some other place. It wasn't that your, uh, that, that your um, instinct was to, to go somewhere beyond it. You yeah. were wanting yeah. to, to have it reflected, yourself reflected in it. But then when you leave it, you are somewhere else. You are, you are, knowing him as the mediator as as just yeah. just said well this is this okay. I mean, the psalms right like this yeah. is the this is the hope that you might come to them for comfort or explanation or something and yet 
they don't leave you alone, right? Again, like this is what you would, this is sort of the hope of this kind of engagement too. It's not just that it's, it's a lens, but also that it doesn't leave you alone, that like something happens to you. And I would just say like my own personal experience, because again, that's kind of part of it is to say, how has this been a, how has this been part of our lives? That transformation doesn't usually happen from just one time. You know, I, I, I wish I could remember where, where I'm getting this from. I want to say it's C.S. Lewis and the abolition of man, but basically this educational notion that like you go to high school and you read Hamlet and then you've like read Shakespeare. <laughs> it's like, okay, hold on. That's not the point. The it's good that you've got the plot. Yeah. It's good that you notice some of the major themes. Yeah. Like, let's say they did a really good job with Hamlet in high school. Yeah. You now have a good foundation on which to dive deeper into it. Yes. Yeah. And so this, I love, like, this is one of the reasons that I was really excited to have you come and talk about, and I mean, you completely delivered on this. So thank you. Talking about the Psalms is like, because particularly for, you know, for the, as a priest or for the religious or the lady that are engaged with this, it is such a commitment to like, to over and over and over. We're going to keep on doing this. And you're, that in itself is something that should teach you something, right? Is the first time the same as the fifth time is the hundredth time? And the answer is no, it's not. And, and I, this is an interesting connection I've never seen before, but so like in, when I, when I work, Right? I, I do a lot of different things. I'll do a lot of different things with my body. What's amazing is, you know, I'll, I'll get into some particular rhythm at some point. Like I've got a lot of jobs where we're, um, where I'm moving rocks with an excavator. And you know, first time it's like, okay, got it. You, you start to smooth it out. You, I could have been doing something for 50, this happens all the time. I'll do something for 50, 60 hours. And all of a sudden I'll have a huge breakthrough and I'm doing it twice as good as I was before. That was a really good construction. I'm twice as good at it as I was. There we go. And there's something about that continual approach to these aspects of reality that if you don't keep coming back to it, you'll never know. And this is, again, to pull from Lewis, just because, you know, so formative for me, he talks about this with resisting temptation. He says, you have no idea what it'll be like to fight after a hundred hours, right? He says, no one, you know, speaking out of World War II, no one ever knew what the German, how strong the German army was by fleeing, right? It's by that coming back to it over and over and having the humility to say, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to continue to stand in this place relative to say the Psalms. Mm -hmm. You'll see stuff. No one else is. I remember, um, it was my senior year of high school. I had applied for seminary. I was accepted. I was going in and my dad brought me a, bought me a four volume breviary because you know, I was going to need that. And that was my Christmas gift. And, uh, and I sat down and, you know, I, I prayed Monday week one, uh, the Monday of the first week of ordinary time, and it was just delightful, you know. And that experience wasn't always delightful after that. <laughs> yeah. You know, there yeah. was a lot of mornings where I had to drag myself to the chapel mm -hmm. because morning prayer was at 710 in Detroit and seven o'clock in, in St. Paul. And I just had to go and do it no matter how I felt about it. Um, and so there really was this uh, this aspect of, of discipline to it, of uh, ascesis, not mm -hmm. asceticism, mm -hmm. uh, training. Uh, and, you know, the church is uh, is very wise when, when she doesn't really give us the option to just be like, eh, not today. <laughs> I'm going to skip Vespers, you know, Vesper Day today. You know? I'm going yeah. I'm yeah. to skip, <laughs> skip Friday, yeah. Friday Psalms. I, I just don't want to. It's all depressing out of Psalm 51, have mercy on me, oh God. My one companion is darkness. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, yeah. I'm just gonna skip all of that. We're not doing that. And that. No, no, you just, you go do it, but. Well, yeah, what you're reflecting on there, you know, maybe we go back to the criticism of Eliot, is that in some sense, the work of it is intrinsic to it. Uh, you know, yes, uh, right. the, yeah. the question of, you know, I, I, I would raise this question to myself when I think about these things. It's, well, why not, you know, why not the music that we have available to us now, contemporary music or, or pop music? All, there are some poetry in there. there. There is some poetic experience in there as well. And, and maybe that's enough. You know, maybe that's the new translation of the old into our modern uh, kind of idiom and our modern experience. But I do think there's, there's, there's some value to, to the high, to the vaulted, to the lofty. And, and 
you know, it can in our context, our cultural context and history, there. I think that's a, there's a negative view of that just intrinsically. Yeah, kind of the anti-intellectualism and, yeah. and and ordinary and superficial is seems to be what people feel, and it has to be easy. It has to be readily accessible, and um, you know there is something to, uh, and I, you know I hate to I hate to say that because it feels like I'm saying oh you got to go be disciplined like you were saying you got to go you, work but out. But you do, but you do but, have to be disciplined but, like. Yeah, but you do. At times. <laughs> <laughs> like, gonna, yeah. I, you can't. You can't like sit someone and say you. Right. You don't need to be disciplined. Like yeah. that's that's actually like hurting someone to tell them you don't have to it's be disciplined. Spiritual malpractice. It is. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, and in the so, educational system, people should be given at least the option to feel like there's a high expectation on them. So, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll bring this around. It's gonna take just a second though. So the first, there's, there's two things that came into my mind there. One is I just finished The Return of the King and there's this really interesting little conversation between Mary and Pippin at the end, right? So, you know, they've done these great deeds. They've, one of them's, let's see, what has Pippin done? Pippin's saved Faramir. Um, and yeah, and he, right, he goes out to the Black Gates, right? And so he's, he's, he's done honorably there before, you know, in this, this fight that will almost certainly end in their utter destruction to give the ring bearer a little time. Mary has helped slay the, the, the king of the ring raids, right? They've done these great deeds and they're, and they're honored for it, uh, but they're still hobbits. And they say something like how they're, they're looking forward to going back and they say, you know, people like you and I can't live long on the heights. And then, the, but then their response is, yeah, but it's really good to have been there and to know what it's like. And so I think that's, you know, we're not all Aragorn. In fact, is anyone Aragorn? I don't know. <laughs> Not a lot of Aragorns. Not a lot of Aragorns out there. But that doesn't mean, right, the whole thing is like, we're all hobbits. Like, that's that's the whole trick to the to the book. Like, we're all the hobbits. And and so that relates to the experience that my family had when we started going to the traditional mass, which is that, you know, it is in, in some ways, right, like there's a lot of kind of, there's a lot of rules around it, right? You be, you be quiet at these times. You have to stand and sit and, right, you don't. It takes a lot of engagement, like, but what I realized was, and, and the language that, that I, I really like is uh, the notion of the Overton window, right? Which is that, right, this is, but that's about political discourse. So there's what's considered middle of the road, and then you have like what you can talk about and then what you can think about and then what's unacceptable. But this idea that the middle in some way determines that, that, that we, we live in somewhere in a spectrum. And so what happened is when we started going to this place that was, you know, once a week or twice a week, or somewhere it's really, really reverent. Like it's very reverent and like everything is centered towards this, these reverential acts and this, lit this very solemn liturgy. What it did is it blew the ceiling off the rest of our lives because now we can be, we can be more serious. Our children have like, they, they know to like, you know, they picked up like you kneel when we pray, you know, these certain kinds of, all this stuff, it, it opened up our home life to all of this, this formality and seriousness in a good way, right? I, I, one of the things I love about Lewis is he talks about serious joy a lot. If you pay attention in his, in his particularly in his fiction, it comes up over and over, this kind of joy that would be ruined by laughing and making jokes, right? So, so, that's, so then when, when you're talking about this need for things that are more high, I would Absolutely. It doesn't mean that you only read poetry right. and you only read fancy poetry and you only listen to classical <laughs> music or whatever. But if you don't make space for something up here, there's an entire just like there's a vast realm of human ex proper human experience that you're not going to be able to get to. So you got to push the top up at some point, right? At yeah. some point in some places so you can have some room. Yeah. And I'll yeah. say, you know, um, I involved a lot of big fancy liturgies, a lot of very serious priests and altar servers <laughs> and bishops and all that sort of thing. And what the most common pattern is, is that we all gather together, we all engage in this worship. Sometimes it takes an hour and a half, sometimes it takes two hours. And then afterwards, there's usually a feast. Yes. And the feast is, is better for having gone through the, um, the formality and the we'll say some of the rigor of the liturgy, you know, especially as now that I'm a, I'm an MC and I'm uh, I'm in charge of a lot of this now, uh, just being able to 
have everything put away and <laughs> sit down and we got mashed potatoes and some pork and, <laughs> and, and the mashed pork. potatoes it's the mashed potatoes the pork and the fraternity are better after, after having that encounter with the rigor and the oh. heights and the reverence yeah i mean you're just it's like lewis talking about sort of because you could you know i would say and we haven't really brought this up i would say that if you wanted to go adjacent to poetry i'd say fairy tales are the next thing like if you're kind of weaving this stuff together fa po fairy tales are probably the closest thing to poetry that we have that's not poetry and lewis and talking about fairy tales he's i think he's basically defending fantasy i want to say this is on story in essays the essay collection on essays presented to charles williams i don't know if anyone in the audience has read this and can back me up but he's he's basically he's dealing with a charge that fantasy is escapism right which i think you could level a similar charge like high poetry is something for snooty people or something like that. His argument is essentially the actual fact is that for most people, when you read fantasy stories, the result is that it actually allows you to love what you've been given more. It produces gratitude and sight, right? We were talking about this in our group. Chester just got this great quote where he says, we talk about, we tell stories about rivers that run with wine. So that for one wild moment, We'll remember that they run with water. And so what you're saying, there's this, there, I think there's this thing that both of you are saying where it's like, when you go up there, it grants you this capacity in ordinary life. That's just wonderful. Like it, it, you can make better jokes for one thing. <laughs> really? Like, like it, 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 when you wrestle with this stuff, it gives you the verbal, it, it helps you in the verbal capacity to like to be funny, to be clever, to have insight in these ordinary things. Probably if you're married, like you can hear what someone else is saying better, right? These like, maybe if you approach it right, there's this, this aspect of empathy, but it's that pushing, it's being pushed and wrestling and having to come into this sort of, it's not antagonistic relationship, but like a struggle, right? There's almost a little bit of like Jacob and the angel there, right? Like here's this thing that's beyond you. And you're like, I'm not going to let go of this poem until I get something out of it, <laughs> you know, until you bless me, you're limping. Yeah, <laughs> that's the paintball. <laughs> yeah, that's um, that's a good, that's a good call. I don't know what else. What it? I I'm, we've, we've got some more time. Yeah, here. yeah, um, yeah. I don't know where I, I've got a a question about inscaping, and this oh, was something excellent. you okay. just you kind of just kind of dipped on, um, <laughs> but it wasn't yes. the, it wasn't the core point. But I'm interested yes. in so. Um, when you were talking about inscaping, the image that came to me was like the Tony Stark workbench from the uh -huh. Marvel movies. Where he's where got like the holograph. He got the holograph, and he can he can disassemble something without destroying. Yes, and that's the main thing I want to look at here. And then okay. um, you talked about how our inscapes give us the ability to actually talk to each other. Yes. So I I, I just have this image of all of us around the fancy dancy. Oh, Tony Stark uh, <laughs> workbench, uh, workbench, and actually looking at something. Yeah, is that what we're doing right now? Yes. So, so what we're doing right now is we are exploring the inscape of poetry. That's what we're doing together. And I, I love. I actually love. Generally, I despise when people compare things to like robots and computers, <laughs> but this is the case in which I love it. I think that's actually a great visual metaphor. So the reason. So, and then I didn't really get to get get into this in my, when I was talking, because I went over anyway. The reason I latched on so hard to this notion of inscape is because I've had certain, let's say, this sort of instantaneous perception of the complexity and yet unity of a thing. In a moment, I can actually tell you the first time I had it as a, as a visceral experience, it was on the Yellow Rock Trail at Devilsden State Park in Fayetteville. And we're out on a hike with a bunch of college friends and I looked over and there's this little bit of moss growing on a branch on a cedar tree right at eye level. And I just, this, this flash of realizing that the, the, the geometric complexity and the biological complexity of this tiny little piece of moss, it's, like, it's all there and it's a thing, but the detail runs all the way up and down. And I never, I, and I, so then I had some of those experiences. I had no notion of what was going on there. To, was it, you, were you talking about, yeah, you were, it was in, it was in your talk this morning where we were talking about, if you don't have the language for it, it's very hard to be able to, 
to, to interact with it, to interact with it. Even. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, Oh, that happened. Well, what was that? I don't know. So then a couple of years later came across a lecture on Hopkins. It was actually a lecture on world is word. Dr. Dr. Ward's book. And that's so many four letter W words. There's no way around it though. But when she started talking, the, the lecturer was talking about Inkscape, So I thought, Oh my goodness, this is what I, this is the thing. And so that's a, there's a, a pers that's a moment of perception and the Inkscape, you know, it can be, it was actually, I actually got to have a conversation with Dr. Ward, which was wonderful and compare notes. And, uh, it's pretty cool. So according to Dr. Ward, you guys have got it. This is, this is, this is what it is. This is what Inkscape is about. Um, when we, it's the ability to focus in on any one of those, like to, to, to pull it, pull it apart without destroying it, pull it apart without destroying it. Right. It's the unity and multiplicity. And so then, so what's interesting is when I talked to Dr. Ward, I said, is this what instress is? And I explained, I said, it's the, it's the awareness of that fundamental unity of the thing. And she said, no, that's the instress of the unicity of the thing. She's like, it's like, all right, I'm out. <laughs> but, but it's exact, but, but instress. So in stress, the reason here, here's one of the reasons that I've been like, like this, like a dog on a, on a bone is because all this stuff from, from, from Verveke and, and Peugeot and Peterson, I feel like Hopkins language is talking about the exact same thing. The way that you in stress is relevance realization, right? It's the act of the will and your perception that focuses on some particular part of it. And if you're not in stressing the right things, then you get into all kinds of trouble and you also can't talk anymore. And that's where Bakey's one of his wonderful points is like when your relevance realization drifts apart, you can't talk to each other anymore. And so if we're able to bring something forward and see and see it together, right? Without tearing it apart. But now we're, we're talking about that same aspect of it, that same perception of it, then we can communicate and there's a relationship between us. Is a, um, is that dependent on a common culture? Mm. Uh, it, in that, and, and this is something I think that Elliot would argue for, and that is that, that without a common culture, without a common toolbox of concepts, you know, ways of framing experience, uh, you know, the variety that is, that is common. You know, I, I, I used this with, with uh, Verveke once, this second inaugural address of, of um, Abraham Lincoln's, uh, uh, where he he just runs in. He just runs right through a couple of Bible verses, in very mm. kind of relatively brief evocations. Not necessarily spending too much time Moby, dwelling on. Moby it. Dick is a great example of that too. Yeah, yeah just chock full. Right. So, <laughs> and he did that at a time when he, I presume, had the expectation that everyone that was listening to him would at least be okay with that, and probably m many of them would actually know what he was talking about. Yeah. And so when you're talking about having words to express, and you're talking about this inscape, in that inscape is kind of evoking a, a wide range of plurality. And in fact, I think you talked about an infinite Yes. Uh, yeah. The, the word you, but can it actually be infinite? In other words, do we need to have a common landscape or somehow a common culture? And, and now that we're living in a world of kind of vast plurality, not necessarily at to not necessarily at anybody's fault. I mean, that yeah. is to say, we we are it's we are intermixed. You with can see everybody. it everywhere. You can right. see everything. We all live with a plant here. Yeah, it's we the, all have uh, a plant here in our pocket. Everything. <laughs> Ever all at once. All yeah, I at once. Yes. That's how? Right. How? Do, yeah. You know, maybe. How do we navigate that? Uh, um, oh, okay. So this is this is great, and I this is something I actually wanted to say, and then I forgot. So, and it, it, it with in, with infinities, there's infinities are weird. Like in math, infinities are weird. Like for instance, some infinities are bigger than other infinities. No like you know, <laughs> yeah. but it makes sense. Okay, if you say you know. All of the let's natural say natural numbers higher than five. All the natural numbers versus all of the rational numbers, right? There's there's actually infinitely more. The it, the all of the rational numbers, all the real numbers <laughs> is infinitely more than all of the rational numbers. 
even though they're both <laughs> infinite. There's also an infinite number of numbers between one and two, right? So how many numbers can you fit between one and two? There's an infinite number of them. So now are those functionally different from each other? Well, it kind of depends. And this is where you start to get into this notion of, of a shared culture, right? And I think you're gonna, I don't wanna, well, I'm gonna push this metaphor a little ways and see what you guys think of it. Because one of the ways to think about this sort of obsession with particularity that we have in society is that, is we're basically saying, no, you have to define this irrational number down, you know, a million digits. And if it's not the same, they're not the same thing. There's a sort of aspect to wisdom that's able to look at, well, it just, it knows what level to look at things, right? It knows, it knows how to round. It knows how to round. That's exactly right. Because that's exactly it doesn't, it it doesn't yeah. sacrifice, um, the wisdom doesn't sacrifice uh, meaning for quantitative precision. Excellent, I love that. So then, so there's that's that could, that could be one that could be one problem. And I and I you you see this in discourse about like lived experience, right? The notion that like my lived experience is not the same as your lived experience, and hidden in that there's this implicit, and therefore it's illegitimate to compare them, right? And so. If you look at, and this is stuff that Hopkins didn't push on at all, but I think you could do some interesting work there. I think even inscapes are probably hierarchical in like aspects of their importance, obviously, right? This is why we call different trees, different trees, right? There's some things they share and some things that are idiosyncratic about it. That's fine, they're still all trees. And so if you don't know how to round, if you just, if you just elevate the idiosyncrasy, then you say, look, there's an infinite number of different trees. And so your experience with that tree can't say anything about this other tree. It's like, well, <laughs> okay. So this is what I say that poetry is a, is a way to order your attention hierarchically. Poetry. Towards quality. Yes, towards quality. Because Absolutely. We are, we are kind of getting near the end of the tyranny of quantity. Yes. Which is what happens when we put all <laughs> of our eggs into the science basket. Yeah. Science absolutely needs to quantify things properly. Uh, but as it turns out, quality is actually much more important in being able to relate things to each other. Yeah, that's, because I mean, that's dead on. the quality that's of being on. a human being. That's how we can, because you know, like I have more mass than you. <laughs> <laughs> you have more hair than me. <laughs> For now. <laughs> For now. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, well, obviously you're you're just completely different, and you can't compare each other. You know, but like, oh, quality, quality actually uh, can join things together, and I think that's at the heart of at least you know written poetry. It's trying yes. to yes. get people to actually look at the quality of something, and that's really hard. Right, it's words. really hard. It's really hard. Like so, so Parker and I had a conversation about about. We've been talking about poetry a lot recently, kind of in preparation for this. And one of the things we're we're, we're, we're thinking about the sort of spectrum of showing versus telling. And we're thinking about how, and I, and I kind of suggested, maybe one of the ways to look at this is that prose could live over on the telling and poetry is as far as you can get to show it. Is you, is you, right. I'm bringing you into my experience of the inscape because if it just say tree, right, we're operating on a certain level. But if we go down and down and down with that, you're actually, they're lining up more, right? Let's say our position in the landscapes are closer to each other. And that's one of the things that it can do. It's, and this is why, you know, people say show not tell in terms of good writing is because you're actually making it a higher, it's a higher resolution. It's a richer, it's a richer inscape that you're presenting there. And so if I say, I like trees. Okay, great. It's like, when I look at a tree, I see this miraculous instantiation of the pattern of reality because reality is shaped like a tree because it's a self-similar fractal. And that also makes sense because in the beginning, we see that that was the connection that God used to creation to grant them the you know eternal life and also knowledge. And then when man fell, it was a tree that was used to redeem because God himself was hung on a tree and then it will be a tree at the end that will bring us eternal life and be the union between God and man. And I say, I love trees and... Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm a little bit, I'm, I'm there a little bit more. Like we've walked, we've walked into that a little bit. Yeah. So that I think, but it's, it's a, it's a, it's a question of, it's a question of gradation. It's not a question of, do you understand me or not? Right? Because when you live in the just world, it's like, did you understand me? There's a sort of bot that there's this yes or no there. And obviously like, you know, with proof rock, I had this wonderful experience today of, 
did I understand proof rock? It's like, that's not even the question. I knew something about proof rock. Like I, you know, I've measured my life in coffee spoons, you know, I, this sort of the ennui of, of this, of this sort of intelligentsia of, you know, in, uh, London at this particular time, the sort of listlessness that comes from it. And then you came along and just like dropped the bottom out of it. It's like, oh, there's so much more here. It doesn't invalidate it or initially I didn't not know the poem. And I think that if we can get into that place, one of the things that frees us to do is both to acknowledge what we know and also be more ready to enter into things even more deeply. And again, to come back to them and to come back to them with this, with this, let's, let's even say faith, right? There's an aspect of faith in praying the Psalms all the time, but like, this is good. It's good to do it for the 8,000th time. <laughs> so, you know, there's a reason to do that.